criminal acts are as old as humanity itself. They tell tales of anger and hatred, greed and suffering, death and depravity. Nothing affords us a deeper look into the sinister depths of a past epoch than the crimes committed during it. Many criminal cases of the distant past still remain unsolved today. No one had the tools to detect the perpetrators, but what was then impossible can now be done. Today's cutting-edge forensic science offers methods for solving many cold cases of antiquity. High-tech diagnostic and forensic procedures help to solve crimes that for centuries had left people scratching their heads. Arsonists are identified, conspirators convicted, and murderers unmasked. The perpetrators may be long dead, but their crimes live on. In this episode, we'll investigate a curious case of infant death, a spectacular arson attack, and the deranged acts of a heretic. A shocking find. The remains of 450 dead babies were discovered in an ancient Greek well. What had happened there? Athens, in the second century before Christ. The city was then a flourishing center of the Mediterranean world. The Romans had not yet conquered Greece. It was the bustling center of public life, the marketplace called the Agora, just below the Acropolis. This was not just a place to buy fresh foods, but also to exchange political opinions. The word agora actually that means to come together to chat. And this was a place where people came to exchange ideas and goods. So politically, culturally, religiously, socially, in many ways, this, this was the kind of the center, the, the beating heart of golden age Athens. But the agora isn't just key to Greek history. It's also foundational for Europe and all of modern civilization because this was the site of the first popular assembly in the history of humanity. All residents of Athens were allowed to take part. Well, not quite all. Women weren't allowed, slaves weren't allowed. At one point, foreigners uh, weren't allowed either. The Agora today. The ancient Athens marketplace has been painstakingly excavated bit by bit. During the dig, the archeologists discovered that this was not only the birthplace of democracy, but also the scene of gruesome events. At excavations right by the ancient Agora, a well, more than 20 meters deep was discovered. At the bottom of it, archeologists made a shocking find. The scattered remains, skulls and bones, of 450 dead babies. Was this evidence of a mass infanticide dating back to antiquity? The case is still the subject of much scientific interest today. No one has studied the grim finds more exhaustively than archaeologist Susan Rotroff and anthropologist Maria Liston. They regularly inspect the scene of the crime. Right here where the tree is, is where they found the babies, where the babies were located 20 meters deep in the well. And this was a very dramatic event for them. They were very shocked by right. finding it. Nothing like this had ever been found before. It's still the single largest deposit of baby bones that's ever been found in a, a single archeological context in the world. The two are not unmoved by their investigations and often reach their limits. It is a very dark story. And to a certain degree, you can distance yourself from it. But when you stop to think about what is really involved, what really happened here almost 2,500 years ago, uh, then it does become disturbing. And you sometimes just have to stop and think about something else for a while. Flashback. The skulls of the 450 dead babies were discovered in 1938 by a team of American archaeologists who were excavating the ancient Agora of Athens. 
The woman who conducted the excavation, Dorothy Burr Thompson, was later one of my professors, and she encouraged me to think about it and see if I could find a solution to the mystery of how the babies came to be there. One of the first theories was that it could indeed have been an horrific case of mass infanticide. We have evidence from the ancient world of the mass slaughter of children. You know, you think, for example, of the slaughter of the innocents at the time of Jesus, when all male boys uh, under the age of two uh, were killed. But that is really, really unusual. It's really atypical. What supports and what weakens the case for ancient multiple infanticides here? The bones of the dead babies from the well are now stored at the American School of Classical Studies in Athens. Here, the scientists once again take a close look at the finds, 80 years after they were discovered. In some ways, one of the biggest challenges was just the sheer number of bones. There were over 13,000 infant bones in this collection, and sorting those out and identifying them by age and trying to identify some individuals in that mass was very difficult. A traumatological diagnosis of the broken baby's skulls produced no evidence that they had been violently crushed. We were able to exclude that this was a mass murder, infanticide, anything like that, because there was no evidence of violence. To find out how the babies did die, the researchers first needed to determine when their remains had been put in the well. The pottery that was found alongside the remains of the 450 babies was a big help. The pottery is very helpful in telling us the date because this particular style of drinking cup, for example, was popular only for about 15 years, 165 to 150 BC, decorated with figures of goats, figures of cupids, and various images of that sort. Most of the pottery finds from the well were vessels used for the care of newborns right after birth. Perhaps the most unusual thing in the well was this small container uh, with a tube. It's for feeding a small child, perhaps a child with some kind of physical disability or difficulty, um, so you were trying to help it and, and care for it by using this. These are found almost exclusively in graves, so it's quite striking that we found it within the well. But in addition to the pottery finds, the skulls themselves also presented evidence that many of the dead babies from the well in Athens had physical handicaps. One of the infants had an unusual looking skull in which there were traces of a disease um, that had caused the bone to grow very rapidly. It had caused areas like the fontanelle, the soft spot in the skull, to not heal. And in looking at, at the sum of all this evidence, it suggests it was a case of hydrocephalus where there is too much cerebrospinal fluid, it causes the skull to expand enormously, and this ultimately would have killed the child. The anthropologist discovered physical deformities in other skeletons as well. For example, the upper jaw of nine of the baby skulls had a cleft palate, a virtual death sentence at the time. Classical philosopher Aristotle stated that handicapped children had no right to life. As in many other cultures, the belief in unworthy life forms was also widespread in ancient Greece. The ancient Greeks did not want to bring up children who were physically challenged. For them, they thought that they'd been cursed somehow by the gods or spirits or demons, so they didn't want to bring that bad religious luck into their homes. It was quite normal uh, that we, we actually find bone evidence of children who have some kind of defamation who've been left to die. As soon as a child was born, it fell to the midwife to examine it for possible handicaps. When something was wrong, her judgment was swift and unsparing. The midwife would take the child from its mother. 
The writings of philosopher Plato tell us that abandoning such babies was common practice. Some were rescued by foster parents, others left to die. Exposing infants and babies was such a normal part of ancient Greek life that it actually makes its way into the myths and legends told about Greek society. So there was even a god, Hephaestus, the, the, the great forging god, who was the child of Hera, uh, the wife of Zeus. And it was said that when Hephaestus was born, Hera looked at this baby and saw that he was ugly, deformed in some way. So threw him off Mount Olympus. Um, eventually he manages to work his way back and, and becomes an Olympian god. And Hephaestus isn't just any deity. He's one of the 12 foremost gods in the Greek pantheon. Though he was left out to die as a child, ancient Athenians even dedicated a temple to Hephaestus. His shrine just happens to be located at the Agora, right near the well where the dead baby's bones were found. Coincidence? Susan Rotroff wanted to find out. After careful inspection of the exact location of the well, she concluded that the site had been chosen purposefully. I think the main reason that the well was used for that purpose was that the neighborhood was abandoned, but it was convenient. It wasn't far away. So a private area that you could use for the task of dealing with the bodies of these babies. So back in the day, the ancient well was a place where physically disabled newborns could be abandoned to die without causing an outcry. But not all of the 450 dead baby remains found there had physical impairments. Why did they too end up in the well? Once again, it was the skulls that put the researchers on the right track. I found a lot of bones had evidence of a sort of spongy growth on top of the underlying normal bone. And this happens when there's a bacterial infection. So it's a bacterial meningitis, potentially. And in a world without antibiotics, of course, this would be fatal. Due to the often poor hygienic conditions, infections at birth were no rarity in the classical era. For example, a non-sterilized implement used to cut the umbilical cord could lead to the infant contracting a deadly infection. Many new parents of the day thus suffered the bitter loss of a newborn. I'm used to working with human remains, but in dealing with this large number of infants, it was really very emotional at times. These are babies who died, their parents grieved for them, and at times it was very hard to maintain an emotional separation. The size of the bone, that is, the stage of its growth, enabled the anthropologist to determine the age of each baby at the time of its death. The result? Not one of the babies from the well had lived for more than a week. In other words, shortly after birth, the mothers had literally handed their babies over to die. It appeared the mystery of the well at the Athens Agora had been solved. But one question remained. Why were the dead infants not buried at a normal cemetery? The Athenians had a ceremony. It was called the Amphidromia, by which a child was accepted into the family and into society. It took place about a week or 10 days after birth. In the Amphidromia ritual, the midwife would carry the infant ceremoniously around an open fire. At the end of the round, she then set the child down at the feet of its father. The child was only officially welcomed into the family fold when the father picked it up from the floor. Any child that did not have the good fortune to live long enough to go through that ceremony would not be regarded as a full person, a full member of society, and therefore they would not receive the normal burial rites. 
And that's why the 450 dead babies were not buried at the cemetery just outside the city gates, as was customary. They died too young to be inducted ceremonially into full personhood, so their bodies were disposed of in a well. But the mass grave at the bottom of the well not only contained infant remains, the researchers made another unusual discovery there. Amongst the baby bones, they also found the skeletons of 150 dogs. The age distribution of the bones is very different from what you expect of the normal die-off of urban dogs. Most of these were young adults, um, although there were also puppies and a few older dogs. But it was clear these were not dogs who were all dying of natural causes. They were being chosen and put into the well. But how does all that relate to the birth? The ancient Greeks believed that birth was a source of impurity, all the more so when the baby was born with a deformity or was stillborn. Dogs could be used as a kind of ritual cleanser. There was a notion that if they were sacrificed, they somehow ritually cleansed those that they were sacrificed with. But also, I think probably the fact that um, dogs are being put into this well, I imagine it's because the parents, the community, thought that these children were going off into the underworld on the, for this difficult, dangerous journey, and it would be helpful for them to have dogs traveling with them. There is much to support this resolution of the curious case. Over 80 years after the remains of the 450 babies were found in the ancient Athens well, the two scientists have shed light on their fate. We know that a lot of infants died. They are not in the cemeteries. We can't see them. And suddenly, for a brief period, we are seeing those children. We know what they're dying of and they're not invisible anymore. And I think that is what resonates for me. And so, one mystery dating back to antiquity has been solved. What had at first looked like evidence of a brutal crime turned out to be nothing more than an unusual burial rite. The Great Fire of Rome. Many centuries later, it's still not clear who or what started it. Was it the act of an emperor gone mad? Rome, capital city of the Roman Empire in the year 64 AD. It was a bright, clear, full moon night at the height of summer. Suddenly a torch was set alight and a fire started. The blaze soon ran rampant throughout the city. By morning, the ancient metropolis Rome stood in flames. The Great Fire of Rome was a genuine disaster, and it destroyed huge swathes of this beautiful capital. There are fires in the ancient world, but nothing on this scale that we know of. Despite all attempts to extinguish the flames, the Great Fire raged on for more than a week. Entire districts of the city fell victim to the conflagration. It left 200,000 Romans homeless. Many others had lost their lives in the flames. We're talking a city of about a million. So this is the mega city of the ancient world. How many people died in this raging fire? Thousands, tens of thousands? It's a big open question. The destruction was so extensive that Romans couldn't believe it had been just an unfortunate accident. Although Emperor Nero hurried to the scene from Antium, 60 kilometers away, many in Rome suspected him of being behind the arson attack. Wasn't Nero an eccentric after all? A raving lunatic even? An image that has stuck to the present day. Nero is a household name today, and if you say his name, people think of this uh, deranged, excessive Roman emperor. Be still. Be still. That's also down to the enduring Hollywood version of the emperor. In Quo Vadis, Peter Ustinov portrays him as quite mad indeed. Summit, summit, illumine me. I am one with 
to God. This scene, more than any other, has formed the image of Nero in the collective consciousness. That the ruler had set fire to his own city in the pursuit of some crazy plans. If that wasn't true, he'd have to make it up. But was Nero really insane? And was the emperor really behind his own capital going up in flames? This question is the subject of great interest in Vienna, the birthplace of psychoanalysis. Here, well-known psychiatrist Dr. Harald Aschauer, a court-appointed expert, has studied Nero's genealogy for years. He wanted to find out if anything in the emperor's family history would support the claim of Nero's mental disorders. We know for sure that certain ailments are present in the Nero family. When you look at the whole family tree, epileptic illnesses, for example, we also find records of depression and anxiety disorders. Nero's genealogy revealed a conspicuously frequent instance of marriages between relatives. That could be a cause of hereditary genetic diseases, such as epilepsy. But Nero himself presents further psychiatric indications, primarily an impulse control disorder. Nero was married to his second wife, Popea Sabina. When she was pregnant for the second time, the historical record tells us he killed her by kicking her in the stomach. On the other hand, he reportedly also mourned the loss of this woman deeply. He then went on to have sexual contact with men who look similar to his deceased wife. To determine whether Nero really was clinically insane, the expert compared all the Roman emperor's documented psychiatric indications with the current criteria of the ICD-10, the WHO's comprehensive classification of psychiatric disorders. In other words, a catalog of characteristics that point to a psychiatric disorder. Someone with a narcissistic personality disorder displays various characteristics, for example, excessive arrogance, very little emotion or empathy for other people. He is purported to have some of these characteristics, but doesn't show the full profile of a narcissistic personality disorder. The psychiatrist concluded that Nero fulfilled only four out of nine criteria of a narcissistic personality disorder. For Dr. Aschauer, that could mean only one thing. According to today's diagnostic schema, Nero did not have a psychiatric illness. But even if Nero wasn't certifiably insane, that doesn't clear him of arson. He was, after all, his fellow Romans' prime suspect. Who are you going to blame? You're going to blame the guy in charge, ultimately, particularly because what we see what Nero does afterwards. He takes a lot of the destroyed city and he builds up a massive palace on a scale that no one had ever seen before. So he really seems to be taking advantage of the destructive forces of the city for himself, and that really is going to anger a lot of people. So Nero did have a motive for the crime. He could actually have been the unseen hand behind the arson attack. But was the great fire of Rome even a case of arson at all? An archaeological experiment would hopefully answer this question. Fire protection expert Tanya Bultmeier and weapons expert Mike Lodes were making final preparations. They aimed to shed light on the obscure events of the night Rome burned. It's not easy so many years after an incident. Normally you're right away there and you can see what happened and you can, can feel the heat still, but this is cold. This is a cold case, but there's evidence. Look at this, there's still black spots on the floor. Scorch marks. Yeah. And there you see what happens if there's really, really hot temperature going on in the building. Well, what, what sort of temperature would it take to, to melt metal like that? Way over 1,000 degrees. So from all this evidence, you can trace a map of where the fire went. With the help of the still visible scorch marks, 
the experts were able to reverse engineer the progression of the fire. Combining their calculations with eyewitness reports, it was possible to determine exactly where the fire 2,000 years ago must have originated, on the south side of the famous Circus Maximus. We know the Circus Maximus had lots of buildings around it, selling food, selling glass, selling clothing, selling everything the Roman citizen wanted, because he went to the races, he won some money on the races, and he went to go to spend the money on the races. Sure, they had some little fires to prepare the food there too. And there would be perfect, you see, there would be food yeah. fires, barbecues to prepare the food. So we have lots of reasons where there could be ignition. Yep. It doesn't have to be arson, it doesn't have to be Nero. <laughs> no, it doesn't have to be Nero. So the fire had started in the immediate vicinity of the Circus Maximus, venue of the famous Roman chariot races. That supports the idea that Nero was not, in fact, behind it, because the emperor's own palace was also located right by the racetrack. Why would he have taken the risk of losing it to the flames as well? We know that Nero had a very valuable large art collection. It was housed in the imperial palace and did in fact fall victim to the fire, a source of great suffering for Nero. He would never have taken that risk. But why the rumors that Nero was behind the arson attack? In whose interest would it have been to accuse him? Nero's had a very bad press, so he's come down through history as uh, kind of mad, bad, and dangerous to know. He kind of didn't do things the Roman way. That means that he had powerful enemies. So there were men within the Senate who didn't trust him um, and who were very ready to blacken his name. The Senate was the true center of power in the Roman Empire. No emperor could rule against the will of the Senate. The relationship between Nero and the Senate changed, evolved over time. And you're gonna see that in his legislation, you're gonna see in his behavior, your megalomania will, will increase as his uh, reign extends. There is no doubt that the longer Nero was in power, the more excessive his egocentricity and delusions of grandeur became. That resulted in a form of imperial dictatorship, now also known as Caesarism. Aren't all Roman emperors megalomaniac? The fact that they begin to think of themselves as uh, being divine, uh, that they have command of this extraordinary empire that ends up commanding a, a fifth of the world's population. So he's not alone uh, in his megalomaniac tendencies. That's the image of Nero that has solidified over the centuries. But not all of it is true. In fact, a large part of it is just invention. Back to the fire experiment. The experts wanted to test their theory that the great fire of Rome could also be explained without arson. This mock-up of a little ancient Roman half-timbered cottage would help them find out. Only the screws were modern. The structure would be set alight to find out how the fire could have spread so fast. So here we've got a typical hut that might be around the Circus Maxima. Can you imagine it on race day? Thousands of people. And what do you want to do on race day? Eat. Eat. Exactly. So I think huts like this, there would be barbecues, there would be roasting chickens, there would be spit roasting pigs, there would be fire in here. Close to the fire source near the Circus Maximus, there were hundreds of little cottages like this, furnished inside simply with straw. When the straw caught fire, the interior temperature rose, causing the outer clay plaster to burst. This just flakes away. Once that's burning, this is out, and now that's a light. And then you got the oxygen getting in there, and the fire spreads everywhere. So it just needs one thing to go wrong. Yeah. Just one ember to fall out of the chicken roaster's fire. 
to set fire to the straw. The straw then knocks the plaster off, the oxygen comes up, and the whole thing now goes up. Yeah. One thing we know for certain is the wind. We know there was a wind, even bigger than today, we know there was a wind because the archaeological evidence tells us, it shows us with the black scarring, how the fire spread around the city. We know from the chroniclers, uh, Dio Cassius and Suetonius and Tacitus, even though Tacitus was only eight, he's a pretty good historian, <laughs> but... Did he really see it all when he was eight? So that, that's a little bit of guesswork there. But they all say there was a big wind. It was time to get serious. The torch was set alight. The experiment could now begin. So we can't really know whether this was an arson attack or whether it was an accident. So what Tanya and I want to find out is if we do start a fire here, how quickly will it start? It doesn't go that quickly, does it? Oh, it takes some time, but it's... when it gets the heat, now you see, now it's going upwards and the flames are licking inside already. What's so now the clay is cracking and see there's smoke coming out of the clay over there. So why, why is this? Because of the heat and there's water in the clay and the water expands and it cracks up the clay. Now look. Yeah, look at that, it's going up, yeah, it's there. going up there. Now we really do start to have something. So the big question is, how could they put this out? You can still put this out with a bucket of water. That's what they had. Now we need to go and find some people with buckets of water. We should. Okay, let's go. But there is another reason why the fire was able to spread so quickly in the narrow lanes of ancient Rome. The reality is most people are living in apartment buildings. And the apartment buildings are made of brick for the first several stories, but beyond them, they're made of wood. Due to the statics of ancient Roman apartment houses, only the lower floors were made of masonry. The upper stories were half timbered or entirely of wood. That was where the poor were housed. And we know that particular poor families would then uh, kind of erect crates on the roof. So there was a huge amount of wood in the city. The accommodation was very, very tightly packed, particularly in the centre. So it's basically um, a, a tinderbox waiting for disaster. Builders of the day paid little mind to fire protection. Open fires in homes were the norm, a nightmare for the firefighters that did in fact exist in ancient Rome. So you have one fire department for every two regions, and there are 14 regions uh, in the city of Rome. And these are people that are specifically trained to fight fires. How are you fighting a fire? You've got bucket brigades, you have pumping systems, they tap into uh, the fountains throughout the city. So you actually have people trained to fight fires. But how effective was the ancient Roman fire department? To find out, modern firefighters would here use the technology of antiquity to try to save a burning Roman cottage from the flames, a similar scenario to the night of the Great Fire of Rome. Let's set this thing alight. I don't know, maybe, maybe it's the, the baker's and he's gone away and his oven's gone up, and now we can start to see... Look at the smoke. People are going to panic right now because the smoke is toxic and they can't breathe. It's catching quite quickly, isn't it? And what we've got to imagine is that just there, there's hundreds and hundreds of these shops, and this is full of people. That's a conflagration. That's a, that makes you, that melts your face. The firefighters formed a bucket brigade and began to extinguish the flames. How it's done. They're coming in with buckets for a great conflagration like this. It's chains of men with buckets. Now, they had a fire brigade, but it wouldn't be this easy. Tanya, come and join me because we're escaping from the Circus Maximus. 
we are in their way. So we are now slowing these guys down because we're a panicking crowd and they don't know where to go. So we're now making a great big mess and it's slowing everything down because we've got panicking crowds getting in the way. And that is really going to make this a much harder challenge for these people to put this fire out. And what we will also find, today is quite a still day, but if it wasn't such a still day, then what you would get is you would get little bits of ember, and then this is blown by the great wind, and it's thrown into another building. And so it goes on over the seven hills of Rome. Embers flying from street to street. Streets become rivers of fire. In the end, the old school arsenal was no match for the flames. The firefighters were exhausted. Finally, they were allowed to extinguish the flames as usual. Within seconds, the fire was put out. Firefighters back then couldn't just roll up with a fire truck. They had no way of pouring thousands of liters of water onto the flames. So the ancient Roman firefighters had to use bucket relays to transport water from the city's wells to the fire hotspots. The missing link in their equipment chain was the fire hose, which the Romans didn't invent until later. So the fire departments sometimes had to resort to another last option. An effective means of fighting fires within the city was to lay fire breaks. In other words, to pull down whole buildings, sometimes even all the structures along a street, so that the fire couldn't jump from one building to the next or to the neighboring street. Of course, the people who lived there weren't thrilled about that. They were perhaps delighted that their house hadn't yet caught fire. And then the emperor's men arrived and tore the walls down. Another explanation for why the Romans were so quick to suspect Nero of arson. To divert suspicion from himself to others, he sought a scapegoat and found one in the Christians. The Christians are an easy target at this time. They are becoming popular, particularly with soldiers. Um, their message of uh, social equality and the possibility of an afterlife is, is very attractive to fighting men. So I think, in a way, uh, Nero is killing two birds with one stone. The emperor was suspicious of the Christians. He feared the growing power of the new sect. He decided to make an example of them. He does affect uh, terrible, abominable, uh, cruel punishments for these Christians. The issue with this, though, is that when Christianity takes hold of Western uh, and indeed Eastern Europe, those who write history are Christians. And so Nero becomes the ultimate uh, evil Roman emperor. So to put it precisely, Nero was the victim of Christian propaganda. He went down in the annals of history as the arsonist of Rome because Christian chroniclers had taken the opportunity to exact their revenge. From a legal standpoint, this much is clear. As long as no further evidence is produced, Nero too is protected by the principle of Roman law in dubio pro rio, when in doubt, for the accused. The most important temple in the ancient Egyptian world was plundered. What was behind the desecration of the shrine? Thebes, in the year 1348 BC. This was the religious center of the kingdom of Egypt. The metropolis on the Nile was rocked by a horrendous act of violence. The main temple of the realm was ravaged. The chief god from about sort of 1850, 1900 BC in Egypt was Amun-Re, and he was the head of the pantheon. It didn't mean that other gods weren't important, but he became 
the state and official god, so the kings would focus on him. The ancient Egyptians believed the temple was the residence of Amun-Ra, that the god actually lived there among the people. So for the contemporary populace, the desecration and destruction of their most important sanctuary was an unspeakable calamity. Especially because none other than Pharaoh Akhenaten was behind it. It's a bit like if the Pope today were to go set fire to the Sistine Chapel. Everyone would ask what's with him. Has he gone mad? The destruction of religious sites and symbols is a time-honored weapon used by the powerful to demoralize those of a different faith. Thus, Charlemagne set fire to the legendary Immunsoh, the seat of Saxon paganism. Likewise, Sultan Mehmed II, upon conquering Constantinople, immediately had the famous Hagia Sophia turned from a church into a mosque. The brutal crimes of Pharaoh Akhenaten were also of historical dimensions. The temple desecration was the violent climax of the devastation of society at large. Akhenaten's ultimate aim was to bring down the ancient Egyptian religion to replace the whole pantheon of gods with one lesser sun god, Aten. The Aten is an aspect of the sun god and existed in, you know, 2400, 2500, 2600 BC, but he was a minor aspect of the sun god. So what Akhenaten did was take this little known god and raise him to great heights and replace Amun-Ra with the Aten. The Egyptians traditionally worshipped a whole panoply of gods, each with a special function. From provincial gods only relevant in individual cities, up to gods of the realm worshipped in official cultic acts of state. Akhenaten wanted to replace them all with Aten, which plunged the entire culture into chaos. The lives of the Egyptian people were seeped in religion. Everything was down to the will of the gods. So what Akhenaten did, pushing the many gods and goddesses into the background in favor of Aten, was an absolute scandal. To help solidify his revolution agenda, Akhenaten had a huge provocation carved in stone, erected in honor of his new monotheistic national deity a monumental shrine to Aten. Measuring 760 meters by 275 meters, it was the largest temple of its time. Akhenaten finally left Thebes altogether and built a new city for himself and his god in the middle of the desert, a pristine spot untainted by all the old gods to serve as his command post for ruling the realm. He moved the capital city to a place that really had not seen much activity before. And this is called Achetaten by him, the horizon of the Aten, where his god was preeminent. Once relocated to the new imperial capital, Akhenaten and his followers could devote themselves fully to the Aten cult, though the people remained unconvinced. Outside of Achet Aten, they clung fiercely to their old faith. Why did Akhenaten plunge his kingdom into chaos? Contemporaries thought he was insane. London. At the medical school of the renowned Imperial College, clinical lecturer Dr. Hutan Ashrafian has studied the case, looking for a possible medical explanation for Akhenaten's actions. He also closely examined the physical depictions of the renowned pharaoh that have survived from antiquity. What we can say is that this is a standard image of Akhenaten. He has a very elongated face, and it's inverse conical. He also has quite large breasts and very feminized hips with a saggy abdomen. So clearly something's abnormal. And Akhenaten wasn't the only member of his family depicted this way. Historical likenesses of his forebears and offspring show similar traits. 
mm. their sculptures show that they, for example, had feminized features and enlarged breasts also. Now, this on top of the fact that in each generation from his predecessors to his descendants, we also have the evidence that people were dying sequentially earlier at younger ages down the line. And so these two say that there's a genetic condition. The medical indications are evidence of a hereditary genetic disorder within Akhenaten's family, a condition that severely curtailed the physical development and lifespan of the afflicted. There are a handful of conditions that could link all of these things together, but specifically temporal lobe epilepsy, which is a type of epilepsy that originates in the sides of the head called the temporal area that controls emotion, visual memory, but also sex hormones, could account for a disease that would link up Akhenaten and his predecessors and his descendants. Akhenaten could have suffered from a form of epilepsy that changes the hormonal status of the afflicted. In the case of men, this can lead to a feminization of the body. And because the disease is seated in the temporal lobes of the brain, it can also trigger psychotic disorders. Temporal lobe epilepsy has long been associated with psychological symptoms. It's a type of epilepsy that originates in the temporal area of the brain, which are here at the sides, and it's associated with visual memory and emotion. It can induce symptoms of hyper-religiosity, which makes one feel that they are in the presence of a very powerful, godlike individual. Historical sources do in fact report that Akhenaten was beset by religious visitations. There are indications that the solar disk, that is his symbol, appeared to Akhenaten in such a state. Were his actions then the result of an epileptic illness? So temporal lobe epilepsy is the most common type of epilepsy, and it is approximately present in between half a percent to one percent of the population and would have been so in ancient Egypt, just as it is today. So in the case of Akhenaten, as he would have got older, he would have had more episodes of temporal lobe epilepsy, and this would have given him more and more sentiments of psychological disease and religious zeal that could account for what he did in his life. Evidence does indicate that Akhenaten was afflicted. In arriving at his diagnosis, clinical lecturer Dr. Ashrafian relied heavily on the image of the pharaoh that characterizes almost all depictions of him. But what if there is an altogether different explanation? You have the king, the queen, who was no relative, the daughters being shown like this, and also many people in the court, um, because of course, what the king is shown as is immediately copied by people. The reality of what the king was is hard to establish because he might have chosen to depict himself in this way, not because he looked like this, but because he was trying to convey a message. So perhaps the statues of Akhenaten do not reflect his actual appearance. In fact, this blend of male and female attributes also appears in other contemporary likenesses of people not in the pharaoh's bloodline. The explanation could be connected to Akhenaten's new Aten cult. The Aten, of whom he is the living incarnation, he was both male and female. He was the force that brought creation into being. So one could also interpret this as Akhenaten trying to convey a concept, which is very common in Egyptian art, that you are trying to convey a whole concept by one image. But what might Akhenaten's aim have been with his unprecedented attack on the very foundations of Egyptian society? One of the reasons that we think that this was going on was because the priests of Amun-Re had gained a huge amount of power, privilege, land, and wealth. And temples played a major role 
in the economy as well as in employment, because most people at one point or the other worked for a temple. Over many generations, the priests had gained immense influence over the politics of the realm. Akhenaten destroyed the priest's power base by suppressing the old gods and limiting access to his one exclusive new god. In the Aten cult, the pharaoh and his family were the high priests. So perhaps Akhenaten's religious revolution was really a brutal instrument to leverage power, consolidate his kingdom, and derail the priest class. Akhenaten was trying to get power back for the king and less power to the priesthood. But the way in which he did it meant that Egypt was really, for a while, thrown into a mess. For the Egyptians, the actions of Akhenaten, whether down to mental illness or power hunger, were unforgivable. For that reason, Akhenaten was later removed from historical records and statues and reliefs of him destroyed. Demnatio Memoriae is basically annihilating someone um, and sort of killing their memory so that it was as if they had never existed. And for the Egyptians, your memory, your name is very crucial because this is what makes you live for eternity. No one wanted to be reminded of the existence of this pharaoh. His religious revolution was considered inexcusable not only during his lifetime, but 50 years on too. Only after his death was the kingdom of Egypt, the culture, able to revive. The people could breathe a sigh of relief. Under Akhenaten's son, the worship of the old gods was reintroduced to Egyptian culture. The new pharaoh demonstratively cast off his birth name and adopted the name of the traditional god of the realm, Amun. Thus, Tutankhaten became the famous child pharaoh, Tutankhamun. <laughs> <laughs>